The final report has been released for the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. The reaction across the country and around the world has been pretty interesting, to say the least. To talk about it is Dr. John Robson. He's an invited professor at the University of Ottawa and a National Post columnist. Welcome back to BCN, John. Thank you. Now, John, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and many others are calling this genocide. Critics say this seems a harsh term when we normally see it reserved for situations like the mass killings in Rwanda. Your thoughts? It seems to me it's a very unfortunate charge to have leveled, partly because it's difficult for people to contest it. But the two essential elements in a genocide. One is there has to be actions that tend to wipe a people out. And second, it has to be deliberate and malicious. And I think that although the situation of Canadian Aboriginals is in many ways very difficult and the past history is tragic and there are elements of malice, no Canadian government ever set itself the objective of wiping out First Nations. And the fact that the report said the genocide was ongoing, that is to say that Justin Trudeau and his administration are engaged in genocide, is surely not just preposterous, but deeply offensive. There is so much goodwill, so much desire to change the trajectory, to right the wrongs of the past to the extent that we can, to fix the problems in the present. Canadians are horrified by the situation under which so many Aboriginals live, including um, that so many are exposed to violence. And it seems to me that calling it genocide isn't just wrong, it's a gratuitous insult. It says that Canadians hate Aboriginals, and it tells us Aboriginals the rest of Canadians just hate you, they want to wipe you out. And this is this is a terrible thing to say, and it seems to me too, it, it's in the antithesis of the spirit of reconciliation. John, a Leche poll revealed that 53% of respondents agreed that the tragedy is part of an ongoing genocide, that it's been centuries in the making, but another 34% disagreed. Any idea what it is that is still ongoing to consider it a genocide? I am baffled by this finding. Again, I know people don't want to seem insensitive by saying, no, it's not that. And I know people are very upset at the condition under which many Aboriginals live. But the archetypal genocide is the Holocaust. Nazi authorities deliberately round up all the Jews they can get their hands on, pack them in cattle cars, and send them to extermination camps, many of which places like Maidanek, there aren't even barracks. Your life expectancy is 45 minutes. Um, maybe at some time in the United States, there was a feeling we'll put them on reservations where they will die off, that there was some sort of sense that we're going to get rid of these people. But in Canada, that's never been government policy. People like Sir John A. Macdonald, who was enlightened for his time, thought we've got to do something to help these people survive. The residential schools, whatever one thinks of the result, were expressly set up so that Aboriginals would acquire the skills that would protect them from disappearing. And uh, again, you look back, where is the malice? Where is the deliberate killing? Uh, you know, some people think, well, there was a certain hostility to Aboriginal culture. And some people would say, well, the genocide could involve simply erasing the ethnic identity without killing the individuals. But to me, again, I, I don't know what people think they're saying when you compare it to what happened in Rwanda, where people are going around with machetes, grabbing members of an ethnic group and hacking them horribly to bits. That's what genocide looks like. And in Canada, I mean, the main thing that killed Aboriginals in the New World was diseases. And people say, oh, Jeffrey Amherst and his smallpox blankets. But, and the real demographic catastrophe, something like 90% of the inhabitants of the Americas died from European diseases in the two centuries after contact. But most of those who died never saw a European. The waves of illness traveled through the populace in ways that nobody planned and nobody could have stopped if they had known what was happening. It's a terrible thing, but a genocide? And today, of course, Canadians are hugely sympathetic. Any policy that you say, well, this is going to help Aboriginals, like, oh, great, great, you know, give them Trans Mountain Pipeline. Hey, economic development, wouldn't that be wonderful? People aren't going around saying, oh, no, we want to get those Indians. It's there's nobody talking like that. So how can there be an ongoing genocide when everybody is really heartbroken at the situation and determined to make it better for these people? Genocides happen when you hate people. They don't happen when you love them. The report also stated that acts of violence stem from colonialism and are coupled with racism, sexism, homophobia and transphobia. Now, can you explain where exactly homophobia and transphobia are contributing to the violence? It seems to me that they just took the politically correct checklist. I mean, they wrote one of those reports that you could have written before you did the study and that a sarcastic critic could have written before you produced your result. 
Uh, one of the things that's very strange about this, well, there are two things. First of all, if you're really concerned about Aboriginal victims of violence, why aren't you looking at missing and murdered men and boys? Because there are a lot more of them. And secondly, if you're concerned about murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls, why don't you ask who's killing them? Because as with murder everywhere, at all times and in all places, the majority of uh, people who are murdered are murdered by people they know quite well. Uh, and very often it's intimate violence. And of course, one of the reasons they didn't want to look at this is because they know that the average Indigenous woman who gets murdered is murdered by a partner who's also Aboriginal. And you can say, yes, but all the violence in the community comes from colonialism and so on. And to some extent, you would have a point. Yes, there's a lot of social dysfunction that comes from the incredible disruption of the collision between European and Aboriginal culture. And you can point and say, had, had Columbus sunk, had no one ever come, maybe things would be different. But you can't go back and sink Columbus. Uh, you have to deal with the situation as it is. And to suggest that it stems from malevolence and colonialism and racism and bigotry, I mean, not that there aren't bigots in this world, but again, homophobia, whatever menace it may present to some homosexuals, if you look at the degree of acceptance and enthusiasm, you know, if you don't march in a pride parade as a politician, you're nobody in this town. Um, the idea that there is this rampant, official, pervasive, deadly homophobia out there, and that the main problem in Aboriginal communities is homophobia. Uh, this to me is, is just somebody picked up a college textbook and, and photocopied it. They didn't look at the situation on the ground and say, who is killing these women and these girls? Why? And what could we do practically to stop it instead of saying how great we are because we have a rainbow flag? Now, the inquiry found that Indigenous women suffer from a higher rate of violence and murders than the general population. Do we actually have clear numbers on that, John? We do have clear numbers on that, and they're, and they're scary. Yes, and it, they also, Indigenous women and girls are murdered at a far higher rate than non-Indigenous women and girls. Indigenous men and boys are also murdered at a far higher rate than non-Indigenous men and boys. And it is true that the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous women is greater even than the gap between non-Indigenous and Indigenous men. So we, we do have good numbers on that. I mean, they're, they're accurate numbers, I should say. They're terrible numbers, but they're accurate. We do know that there is an epidemic of violence in Aboriginal communities. But what the inquiry doesn't really tell us is how do we make this stop? I mean, th this long list of politically correct demands, it's not a practical program. And it it's like, you know, they they've had this situation in, in American inner cities, you know, do you do polls of, of black residents of poor neighborhoods and, and they say, we're not happy with the policing. But if you ask them, what's the problem? They say, there aren't police around. Help, would you please send some cops to arrest the criminals? Um, there, the practical idea that we should save lives one by one until there's a lot fewer people getting killed and then we'll fix colonialism. It, it seems to me very unfortunate they didn't have a more practical eye to fixing the problems and saying, oh, well, structural this and, you know, we'll have re-education for police and that sort of thing. I mean, let me ask you a blunt question. Would you want to be a non-Aboriginal police officer assigned to one of these remote communities when you're the agent of a genocidal regime and that's what they're telling the people there? How are you going to investigate, find problems before they erupt into lethality and do something effective about it? Because that's what the victims need. First and foremost, they need not to be murdered. Everything else that's going to happen that'll be any good for them depends first and foremost on that. You know, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because we do hear that often, that it's Indigenous on Indigenous when it comes to the murders. In many states in the United States, it's black on black crime. So how do we solve those issues? Is a lot of it to do with education, getting into those communities? Well, I mean, if you, I mean, I'll take the American example first. If you want to get rid of most of the inner city violence in the United States, you would legalize drugs because so much of that violence is, surround, is security issues surrounding the drug trade. Uh, but in terms of Aboriginal communities, what's killing people there, directly and indirectly, I think more than anything is ho hopelessness and despair. And you have to create economic opportunities. And I don't think you do that by saying, well, things were great 500 years ago. We need to get back to that. Because the 21st century is upon us, whether we like it or not, Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal. There's a lot that I don't like about the modern world, but I can't make it go away by going, boo, down with you, modernity. 
And the idea that we can fix this problem without people having private sector jobs, self-supporting, self-respecting. So resource development is very important because for a lot of these communities. I mean, don't forget, a lot of Aboriginals live in cities, but a lot of them do live in places where the sorts of jobs that most Canadians get just don't exist. Resources need to be developed. And these anti-pipeline protesters saying, oh, all Aboriginals are with us. That's not true at all. A lot of Aboriginal communities are saying, oh, please, a pipeline, jobs for our people, you know, as carpenters, as electricians, all the kind of things that happen when construction and maintenance go on. Um, this more than anything, because when people talk about the ways of the ancestors, I'll tell you one thing about the ways of the ancestors that I think doesn't get enough emphasis. They supported themselves. They had a tough life. They didn't have a lot of technology. Northern Canada is kind of a hostile environment, but they got a living out of it, and they came home at the end of the day knowing they'd done it themselves. And nothing is going to fix the problems, all the problems, from violence to substance abuse, except getting that feeling back, that we are, in fact, making our own lives work. Yeah, you know, the opioid crisis has hit many regions across Canada, including the reserves, too. You know, many of the tribes that we've spoken to, a lot of the Aboriginal community. John, does this inquiry provide any solutions to violence against Indigenous women and girls? I mean, it, it's such a grab bag. I mean, you can go through hundreds of recommendations. I'm sure there's some stuff that will help. But fundamentally, it's just same old, same old. And in a few years, they'll do another one, and, and it'll say the same thing. If they actually issued the same report, I don't know how many people would notice that they hadn't, make a few cosmetic changes. Uh, I think that... You know, the things that people won't talk about, the deadening effect of welfare dependency, um, the need to break the cycle, which is unfortunately very real in a lot of Aboriginal communities, fetal alcohol syndrome, and young people who just don't understand consequences. And to think we have got to change things so that we produce a generation of young Aboriginals that can make it in the modern world that have the skills that you need in the 21st century. And if they have some special wisdom to do with the environment and some particular connection with nature, I mean, I'm happy for them, but share it with us because we all need that. Uh, but at the same time, stop dwelling upon past grievances and a way of life that whatever its merits and whatever its drawbacks is gone and can't come back. You've, you have got to get away. Thomas Sowell once said that victimization sits on your shoulder whispering that you're damaged goods. And the more you tell Aboriginals, oh, well, colonialism did it to you, the more they think, well, I can't do anything. I was colonized. As opposed to saying, you know what? If I had a choice, maybe I wouldn't be starting from here, but I am here. And what was it um, Arthur Ashe said, start where you are, do what you, use what you have, do what you can. And that, I find that mentality missing from these reports in a way that I think is tragic. Why not? a call to Aboriginals themselves, I will not hit my partner. I'm gonna stop the cycle of violence in this house myself. And again, I'm, the first great American black leader after slavery, Booker T. Washington, was very much a preacher of the gospel of self-help. And Washington said, look, we're in a mess that white people put us in. They enslaved us, they denied us education, they called us dirty names. You know, yeah, it's their fault we're in the condition we're in right now but they're not gonna fix it for us and they can't fix it for us even if they wanted to. We must pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. And I think we need more of that message. You say, don't, we're not asking you to say, yeah, it's our fault we're here, it's not. But we're asking you to say, we may not be the problem, but we're the solution. And that I think is what you really, and to look them in the eye and say, not only should you do it, but we know you can do it. Because there is a message of helplessness often in these reports, which I think is enormously destructive though well-meaning. So, John, one of the allegations is that police do not put the same effort and resources into finding the perpetrators of these crimes and bringing them to justice as compared to crimes against the general population. Any truth to that? I think there may at one time have been some truth to it. I do not think there is much truth to it now. And I think I would ask people, that's such a nasty thing to say about the police, so you don't care if an Indian gets murdered. Put yourselves in the boots of an RCMP officer in one of these detachments with this kind of circumstance going on, how much cooperation do they get from the community? How clear an idea do they have of who probably did it? And how difficult is it to get evidence? Would you take on that job? And if you did take on that job, do you think you could improve uh, the rate at which we solve these crimes? Because, I mean, this, this sort of backseat of the cruiser driving 
to say, oh, they could fix this if they wanted to. They're just a bunch of nasty bigots. How many people choose a career in policing and a career in policing in that part of Canada because they don't care what happens to Aboriginals? I think it's a terribly mean-spirited thing to say. And I think that there's probably a lot of frustration among the police. Uh, and this sure isn't going to help them to be more effective in getting this done. Um, I, it's heartbreaking. You send people into these communities, they come back in tears sometimes over what they've seen. And if you then say to them, ah, well, you're just a callous white bigot, um, that, that is so unfair to them. And it's so unhelpful in terms of finally doing something about this problem that is so heartbreaking and that has gone on for generations. Dr. John Robson, an invited professor at the University of Ottawa and a National Post columnist, thanks a lot for joining me today. Thank you. And behalf of all of us here at BCN, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and have a great day.